Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, I gotta say, it is a huge, huge, huge honor to be speaking at the Fee Mansion uh, before it closes down for good. Uh, to be one of the last and objectively the best speaker uh, is an honor I will always carry. And I'm, I'm being a little glib about it, but I'm not because, as most of the people in this room know, this is where the Liberty Movement started. Uh, the Fee Mansion was basically a lighthouse in a very dark world in uh, 1946, I believe, when uh, Leonard Reed started it. And to be standing in the room in the same building where you know, Leonard Reed got a series of increasingly irate letters from Ayn Rand uh, accusing him of Stalinism is to be part of <laughs> libertarian history and also to realize that the infighting, you know, is not something that's new to us. It's been here since there are only four people in the movement and five perspectives on what liberty really means. So let me talk a little bit about the book and this project and, and how it came to be. I was working on a I'm a celebrity ghostwriter by trade, and what that means is I'll sit down with a celebrity and I'll help them craft their autobiography or something like that. Uh, in effect, how I look at it is I'm writing a novel about a character that happens to be real. And just like someone on Top Chef or Project One Way, I have to you know, engage in my creativity given certain very real constraints. Uh, in those cases, the facts of reality you know, and their personal history and their perspective. So I was working on one project with a celebrity who will be uh, left unmentioned. It was not going so well. Um, and my friend, Justin Esch, who is the inventor of such products as bacon salt, bacon A's, bacon coffin, and bacon lube, uh, took me to his house to give me food, which the celebrity was not providing at the time. Uh, and he said, you should write Kim Jong-il's autobiography. And this, you know, was something that appealed to me immediately and profoundly for several reasons. God bless you, Ed. Um, uh, one of the things is everyone in this country and indeed the Western world is aware of who Kim Jong-il is, is aware of what he represents, and has absolutely no understanding of who he really is and what he really represents. We have a very visceral, glib, outsider perspective on him and on North Korea. And as someone who is a passionate advocate of liberty, uh, I thought this was both an opportunity and a problem. Because if we move the needle here in the States uh, regarding freedom, it's not really, it's not really going to have that much of an effect. But if we move the needle in the least free nation on Earth, which North Korea objectively and certainly is, that might have the effect of saving actual lives. Uh, one of the things that most people are aware of is that there are hundreds of thousands of people in concentration camps there right now as we speak. They have been, these camps have been there for decades. If you go on Google Earth, you can see them for yourself. And yet much of the mainstream media seems to be interested in some crazy and or drunk and or stupid basketball player paying a visit there. And it is, uh, I think, almost kind of obscene that this is where the focus is. And then at the same time, we'll sit in our you know, history classes and wring our hands and wonder how the world let the Holocaust happen. Um, and somehow, you know, it's funny that they have this wacky system. So uh, I knew this was a very, very big project and it would be a very difficult project. I knew very little about North Korea, you know, just the usual visceral stuff. Kim jong Il's a great golf player. Things are really bad over there. Uh, you know, he's got this wacky sense of self-importance and so on and so forth. And, and I thought it would be kind of a little bit of a joke, but I thought it would be something I could really stick my teeth into. And it really hit close to home for me personally, because I am Jewish, I was born in the Soviet Union, and those were two cases where bad things could have happened to me very easily, uh, sh should the circumstances of my life had been very different. But because my family and I, you know, all escaped the Soviet Union in the late 70s and moved to the States, you know, I was given opportunities. And now that I'm at a point in my career as an author where I can work on a project that might not be as profitable, but certainly uh, something I'm passionate about and might have positive effects. I felt it was my kind of obligation uh, to do something about it. So I sent a book proposal, sent it out to all these different editors, and their reactions were all the same. You're crazy. Uh, what are you talking about? How are you going to write an autobiography about someone who's dead and who you've never met? Um, you know, publishing is very regimented. If you take any book at the bookstore and you flip it over and look at the back, at the upper left, you're going to have a subject about where to place it. It'll say fiction, philosophy, self-help. Are they going to put this under 
Korea? Are they going to put this under autobiography? Are they going to put it under satire? They didn't know what to make of it, so they all said no. So I said, in the same sense as John Galt, I'm going to do something about this once and for all. Uh, there's no reason for me to go through somebody else's you know, imperator. I can do something about it myself. So I went to North Korea. Um, I did not realize how easy it is to go to North Korea. I was looking at Facebook one day, and my friend Ed, who's extremely well traveled, uh, had put up a you know series of photographs. And there's one I'll never forget. He, there's the tanks, you know, going through Pyongyang in the background, and he's got his dim-witted grin in the foreground, smiling at the camera. And I'm like, Ed's in North Korea, and. North Korea, it is legal to go. And the reason it is legal to go to North Korea is North Korea has the very dubious distinction of being the first communist nation to declare bankruptcy. As a result, uh, as Rand always says, you can escape the laws of reality, but you can't escape the consequences of ignoring the laws of reality. Their credit rating is nil on the international scene, so they are desperate for hard currency. Their yuan is worthless and you know, extremely inflationary, so they want the Chinese RMB, they want the euros, they want the dollars. They produce almost nothing of value, uh, so they want tourists to come in and give them those dollars. So it's, it's legal, it's expensive. Um, but you have absolutely the best party cred. I live in New York City, so if people are talking about where they went to their summer vacation and you say, I've been to Pyongyang, and you know, then you could be like, oh, you've never been? <laughs> oh, you have to go. <laughs> Milan is so over. Um, you have to say it like that. <laughs> Otherwise, you lose the effect. So, you know, I got in a plane. There's only one flight in and out. Uh, every day. I did not know if I was still going to do this book, but I thought the regime's not going to be around as is for much longer, and there's no place on earth that would, I would find more interesting and more uh, kind of exciting. And it's just kind of funny, the first trip I decide to take as an adult outside of the States is to North Korea instead of like Bermuda or something. Um, so you land, when you land in Pyongyang, it, it, you don't like, it, it's near Pyongyang, the airport, it is impossible to describe what it's like, because as most people know, uh, the iconography of North Korea is everywhere in the country you see giant portraits of the great leader who is the founder of North Korea, Kim Il-sung, Kim Jong-il's father, and of Kim Jong-il, the dear leader, side by side. And you see it everywhere and you're in the airport and North Korea, because of their lack of currency, has very little electricity. So you're in this airport, which is basically a giant like hangar with no lights on and there's one little conveyor belt and there's one metal detector in the back and it's like the size of a football field and if you look at the very back at the very top wall are giant portraits you know that are like a yard tall and you're like holy crap I'm in North Korea and then you're like I don't want to say or do the wrong thing because bad things happen to people in North Korea who say or do the wrong thing and as we you know you have to go as a group and there are tour guides you know with you at all times which is regarded as somewhat ominous I think it's completely not ominous at all because it's not unusual for any country if you visit for them to have a tour guide who's going to show you around um, the, the guides speak perfect English, their cadence is a little off, but their accents are superb. And as we were driving from the airport to our hotel, uh, there's something in North Korea called the Rogyang Hotel. I'm pronouncing it completely wrong. It's by far the tallest building in North Korea. It was left unfinished in the late 80s. And now it's nicknamed the Hotel of Doom because it's also structurally unsound. It, it hunkers this giant edifice. It's been called the worst, worst building in the world. Uh, and supposedly they even Photoshop it out of some of their postcards lest they be, you know, admitting that they messed up pretty badly. And my guide pointed to that hotel and she goes, there's th that hotel, that's our latest rocket launch. So the fact that she was being glib and about both about geopolitics and about the state of nature in, in North Korea really was kind of uh, shocking to me. Uh, and I'll, I wrote about my trip for reason. If you go to kimjongilbook.com, you can read about it there. Uh, but briefly, I, I really wanted to understand what the people in North Korea think of themselves and the outside world. Are they aware? Uh, do they care? Because you're not allowed to use a computer. They have no electricity. If you have foreign materials, you'll be executed. Um, and you know the regime is notorious, even by communist standards, for their brutality and arbitrary detentions and things like that. So using the skills I have when I work with a celebrity to write their life story, I'm always kind of picking at them and trying to break down their barriers. And I was doing this with my guide. And i um, spoiling the article, but a big moment you know, was towards the end. Well, here's, there's a couple of moments. 
One is one of the people on my tour had an accordion camera. And I'm like, oh, you're such a hipster. And my guide says, what does that mean, hipster? Now, trying to explain what a hipster is to, <laughs> some, to someone in North Korea uh, was difficult, but as someone who uses language for a living, I rose to the challenge. And I remembered my friend's definition, which is a hipster is someone who likes anything old-fashioned just because it's old-fashioned. So I said, oh, hips, that's what they like. She's like, oh, okay. And then, you know, kind of she made a mental note. And then later in that trip, I was at, um, there's a tailor in the hotel where you stay at. And the hotel you stay at is on an island. It's nicknamed the Alcatraz of Fun because you're not allowed to leave. Uh, the guides are not allowed on your floor. Every floor you're segregated by your nationality. And in fact, the guide's floor is the windows are, are blacked out or, or, or apparently because it's pitch black. They just step off the elevator into darkness. It's, it's just creepy as hell. Um, but there's a tailor in the hotel, uh, but it turns out it was a sweatshop. They live in the hotel and they'll make suits for you. And I go in to get a suit made and they're pointing out all these lovely, you know, Western style suits. And I go, no, 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 no. I want a suit like, you know, Kim Il-sung, the great leader. I want it with that collar where it, like the Mao suit and the old boxy and military style. And she goes, oh, hipster. <laughs> And of course, as a real hipster, I denied being a hipster, <laughs> but she didn't get that joke, but they, they custom made the suit. Uh, and it was a very funny moment because as I was trying on the suit my last day, my guy just looks at me side eyed. She goes, oh, you look good. It was a very, very, very odd moment. But what really kind of affected me the last day I was, they have something in there called Cholima. And Cholima is this Pegasus and it's their symbol of speed. Right? And they had this Cholima movement in the late 60s, early 70s about revolutionizing everything. So I was revolutionizing, making things faster and better. Um, and I was talking to my guide. I said, if I can mail you anything from the outside world, what do you want me to send you? And she goes, a Porsche. <laughs> and I said, lady, I'm not sending you a Porsche. And I said, and don't ask me to send you a Cholima either. And she goes, we have the original one here. Why do I need you to send it to me? <laughs> so she was very, very quick in a language that was not her own. And she was very, very relaxed, and she was very, very human. And one of the things we often forget, well, maybe not the people in this room, but the press often forgets, is that these people who are living in these situations, you know, Gerald Ford in 1976 was castigated when he said that there's no Soviet domination in Eastern Europe. And what he later said in his autobiography, which may have been a lie, I don't know, but he claimed that the domination is not in their hearts. Yes, they are, you know, under this dictatorial regime, but they're not broken. They are human beings. And you see that constantly when you're in North Korea. You see people skipping down the street. You see kids giggling. You see grandmas doting over their grandkids. And that, to me, makes the cause that much more important. And it's that much more heartbreaking. Uh, if communism had the ability to change human nature and to turn humans into robots, maybe it would be more effective, but it doesn't have that power. So, you know, these people are really suffering and they are deserving of our empathy. I do not know what we can do, uh, but I did the only thing I knew I could do, which is write a book and talk about it. So what did I do? I came back to the States and there's a, pro there's a website uh, called Kickstarter which is a kind of a recent innovation. Uh, four years ago, or five years ago even, if I chose to self-publish a book, my career would be absolutely ruined. You know, I write best New York Times bestsellers for a living. To self-publish, you're like a wacky crank, you know, forget it, you're, it's like a scarlet letter. But Kickstarter, how it works is, you put forth a video, this is what I want my project to be, they have them for movies, albums, you know, you know all, like candy bars, anything, you name it. And people give you a little bit of money, and you set what your goal is ahead of time, and if you reach your goal, you get all that money. So I, so I filmed the video in this very building. Chuck Grimmett in the back uh, filmed it, and I made this kind of tongue-in-cheek video, and I said, this is the project I want to do. And I raised more money than I would have gotten as a book advance if I'd gone through a publisher. Uh, and this is the power of the market, and this is you know, just another way that you know, the internet is taking away gatekeepers' ability to so to speak, uh, God bless you, to, so to speak, you know, allow worthy, worthy projects to reach the market. And the Liberty Movement was very, very key uh, to helping with this. And it was just a great, great feeling to be able to, you know, get that funding. Now I had to write the thing. Okay, so when I was in Pyongyang, I brought back armfuls of their propaganda. 
Their propaganda is translated into several languages, English, French, German, Spanish, Arabic, Chinese, Japanese, uh, a couple of others, because they are under the conceit that everyone in the world is fascinated with North Korea and we can't get enough, and, and their philosophy, which is known as Juche, is the guiding light of the 21st century and people are obsessed with it. So they have many, many books and I read all of them. And let me tell anyone in this room, if anyone is interested in reading North Korean communist propaganda, it is much worse than you think. And I know you think it's pretty bad, but I assure you, it is much, much worse. And, and if I wanted to be really Machiavellian about it, I would even gather that the point of these books is to destroy critical thought as opposed to an uh, unintended consequence, because the stories are all plotting and, and boring and the same. Uh, there's a problem in the factory. Kim Jong-il shows up. Did you try this very obvious thing? No, none of us thought of it. Try this very obvious thing. Oh my god, you're amazing. Well, I heard there's a problem in the school. Stay tuned. Uh, and, and that's really, this story is over and over because it's supposed to beat into people's heads that the leaders, the great leader Kim Il-sung and the dear leader Kim Jong-il are the ones running the show. And but for them, North Korea would be a complete disaster. So they are very much obsessed with inculcating this air of authority uh, in North Korea. And one of the things I wanted to do in this book is write it almost like a murder mystery. Uh, we know who the victims are, which is the North Korean people, 24 million. How did it get to this point? How did the Kim family, uh, you know, manage to finagle uh, the situation to get to this point? And how did the rest of the world allow it to happen? And it mapped out perfectly to Kim Jong-il's life because he was born in the early 40s during World War II when Korea was becoming split into two nations uh, and he died in 2011 uh, so his life maps out perfectly to the history of North Korea as a nation so if you read the book you're going to get an understanding of how things got to the way they are but let me just give you the very quick since my talk is w North Korean one lesson uh, a very quick synopsis of how things got to be you know where they are today so, you know, post-World War II, uh, North, North Koreans very much resent, and for some reason correctly, the fact that they were the only nation divided into two other than Germany. They were not combatants, enemy combatants. They were on this, you know, they were colonized previous to that by the Japanese, who by all accounts did not treat them very well. The Japanese, you know, tried to destroy Korean as a language itself. Everyone had, in, in Korea had to take a Japanese name, they had to speak Japanese in school, uh, and so on and so forth, and, and you know, any kind of colony uh, is, is really, in general, not treated that well by those who colonize it. Um, and come World War II, it was like, well, they, the Russians were going to have the North and, and several other places, and the Americans were going to have custody over the South and several other places. And they basically sat down with the map. The, the Americans very much wanted to have Seoul, uh, which, is, was the, which is the capital currently of South Korea. So they just basically cut it down the middle, just north of Seoul. And, you know, you had the Russians on the top and, and the Americans on the South. And one of the things that, you know, North Korea criticizes the South about, which is valid, is that America has a very nasty habit of uh, invading a nation, uh, causing bad things to happen there, as wars want to do, and then installing some strong man who is, might, might be, you know, have loyalties to the states, but is hardly a libertarian. Uh, and is hardly in the long term really going to be great for the people. So the Russians in their, on their half installed um, Kim Il-sung and the Americans in their half installed Sigmund Rhee. Um, and Kim Il-sung, who is the great leader, is 100 times more important than Kim Jong-il, even though few Americans know about him compared to Kim Jong-il. It's like comparing Frank Sinatra to Nancy Sinatra. Uh, no one would care about Nancy Sinatra but for Frank Sinatra. <laughs> So the thing is, Kim Il-sung was, you know, the leader of this ragtag band of communist rebels fighting in Manchuria. Uh, there's almost no historical record of him doing anything, which North Korea very brilliantly points out as proof of the extent of Japanese censorship. You can't find any evidence that he did anything because the wicked Jap devils wiped it all out from the historical record. And that just shows how pernicious and pervasive their control and censorship was. And the idea was he was going to be a puppet of Stalin and follow suit like all the other communist uh, nations. And come uh, 1950, come, you know, come the post-World War II era, era excuse me, Kim Il-sung decided he was going to unify Korea under his rule. He invaded the South. He, at one point, he had 95% of the Korean Peninsula under his control. You know, the U.S. and the U.N. counterattacked, and you had the Korean War, which was basically a proxy war between uh, the U.S. on one hand and Western democracies, 
and the other hand you had the Soviet Union in China and Korea, which North Korea, which often describes itself as quote a shrimp among whales. When you have that small country in between these gigantic powers, the people themselves, you know, suffer enormous casualties. Uh, you know, you had dams being destroyed, and 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 just the massacre was just absolutely horrific on both sides. And basically, at the end of the Korean War, you it was back where it started, and and you had North Korea and South Korea. Korea it was riven in two. And what's very very funny, if you go to North Korea, there's a museum uh, right by the DMZ, which is the demilitarized zone, which divides the two Koreas, and they will point to you to the UN flag and the UN dossiers that the Americans left. And this, of course, is proof that the Americans were so embarrassed at their humiliating defeat by the great leader Kim Il-sung that they left it behind to flee with their proverbial or maybe literal tails between their legs. And in fact, one of the other things that was very, very shocking to me while reading all the propaganda, and I had to read 60, 60 books in order to craft Dear Reader, is that every criticism of North Korea, they tackle and they address. They don't sweep things under the rug. The most horrific and kind of ironic and Orwellian of them is, you know, the UN very recently attacked them for the human rights abuses and having concentration camps, and they say, we don't use the term concentration camps, therefore we don't have any. <laughs> uh, and it's, 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 the only alternative we have is to laugh, because if you understand the reality, it's just so horrific that they could say something like this with a straight face. Um, so, you know, in the book I have him defending censorship because at one point, it, you know, in 19, uh, I think it was 56, Khrushchev started to liberalize the Soviet Union and most of these satellite states followed suit. And Kim Il-sung found this to be absolutely outrageous because he was a Stalinist, he believed in absolute totalitarianism. And there was an attempt to remove Kim Il-sung from power. He got wind of this attempt and there was a plenary congress and he literally stacked, um, you know, people who were disloyal, he sat the people around them with people who were loyal to him. And as soon as any of these people got up to speak, those around them literally started shouting them down. The, they were not given a chance to speak at all. Those who were wavering saw how things were going and sided with Kim Il-sung. And of course, all those people who wanted uh, North Korea to kind of liberalize and follow the Soviet model were taken to the camps with their families uh, and were never seen again. Uh, and, and after that, you know, all sorts of other things happen. Korea, both Koreas have a very long history of xenophobia, uh, you know, extreme racism. Um, so he stopped banning uh, Russian, learning Russian at schools, any foreign literature, any news of the outside world. Korea has for centuries been known as the Hermit Kingdom. In fact, you know, it was illegal for foreigners to step foot in Korea even in the 19th century. And it really became the case that any foreign, anything foreign had to be completely eliminated. Korean was good, foreign is bad. Uh, now, this is a very difficult thing to pull off because Korea did not have many um, accomplishments to its name. So, of course, the, re the Orwellian revisionism began, which is all these great accomplishments that the Japanese had were actually originated from Korea. In fact, even Mount Fuji is taken from the word Korean and pottery and all these other things the Korean people themselves invented. And there's no greater exemplar of this than the great leader Kim Il-sung. And when you have this sort of absolute uh, dictatorship, People very quickly, you know, learn what's politically correct and what's not, and, and they mouth what they need to mouth, and they smile and nod, and they do what they have to in order to keep themselves and their families safe. And Kim Il-sung played uh, China versus the Soviet Union like a fiddle, uh, and he, they basically became a literal welfare state, getting friendship prices, meaning uh, the Chinese would send them, let's suppose, gasoline or, you know, so, or machines, and they would send back like useless, disgusting socks, and they would say that that's a barter and it's equal. Uh, and, and for a long time, North Korea was actually doing better than the South, because the South was regarded as this agrarian backwater. Um, and things kind of came to a head with the states in uh, 1968. Uh, there was an American ship called um, uh, Pueblo, and it was off the coast of North Korea. The C North Koreans captured them. They kept the men prisoner for a year. Uh, and as they negotiated with uh, quote-unquote war maniac Lyndon Johnson, uh, of course informing his negotiators that John F. Kennedy is already rotting in hell and that they will soon be joining them. And, you know, in typical North Korean bombast, if we, you know, kind of attack North Korea, they'll destroy the world and all these other doomsday things will happen. So the negotiations went on for a year and at the end of the year they came to a compromise. The Americans just 
I can only imagine throwing their hands up said, how about, because the North Koreans said you have to admit you're spying and apologize, and the American says, absolutely not, we're not admitting to spying and apologizing, that's crazy, you have to admit, no, they go, what if, the Americans put this forward, we admit we were spying and apologize in writing, but as we're signing it, we say this is all a lie. And the North Koreans are like, oh yeah, it's fine. <laughs> And that literally happened. There is the ceremony where the general is like, uh, I, I, the quotes in the book where he says, the document I'm about to sign claims the following. Uh, anything that it says is at variance with the facts, does not contradict the facts. I will sign this document to free the man and only to free the man. And he signed the document, and that document is on display in Pyongyang, and the men were set free, the boat is still there. It is the only U.S. Navy ship, commissioned ship, that is not under possession of the U.S. government. But that kind of speaks to a little bit of the craziness uh, of what is going on there and what is going on here. And, and the fun part of writing this book was, all the crazy stuff I didn't need to edit at all. I played it at face value and you read it and you're like, okay, whatever. And then you go on Wikipedia and it's verbatim, this is exactly what happened. And come the late 60s is when uh, Kim Jong-il uh, started you know, working behind the scenes. He was put in charge of the propaganda department for the Workers' Party, which is their equivalent of the Communist Party. He reinvented the movie industry. He, he invented a, a completely new form of opera called Pang Chang. Because under Greek opera, for example, you have the Greek choir behind you, you know, speaking, singing, excuse me, and, and moving the action along. But in Korean opera, the choir is off stage, which is completely different and completely revolutionized, uh, and is more important than the Copernican Revolution, if you ask them. Uh, so all these superlatives are just absolutely amazing. They will tell you that Kim Jong Il's college thesis, the role of the county in establishing socialism, was more important than Columbus discovering America. Something which even given communist premises, I doubt it to be true. Um, but there became this big power struggle behind the scenes between Kim Jong-il and his uncle uh, to see who would become the successor to the great leader Kim Il-sung. And one of the crowding achievements was building this, I think it's like a 10-story statue in Pyongyang of, of Kim Jong-il looking just like the Walt Disney statue, uh, plated in gold until Deng, jo Deng Xiaoping said, you know, you're supposed to be a communist country, maybe a 10-foot 10-story tall gold-plated icon is not really what we're about, so they changed it to bronze, uh, which is much more, of course, uh, you know, populist to have a 10-story bronze statue. And to this day, everyone who visits Pyongyang has to go in front of the statue and bow down and lay flowers, and if you're getting married, you bow down before the statue. And every town in North Korea has a giant statue of Kim Jong-il, uh, which is only recent, or Kim Il-sung, the great leader, uh, or Kim Jong-il's mother, uh, anti-Japanese heroine Kim Jong-suk. They're this holy trinity uh, that kind of governs the nation. Um, and all these other insane kind of personality cult things started happening. Everyone in North Korea has to wear a badge with either the great leader, the dear leader, or both at all times. Everyone in North Korea has to have a photograph that the government issues of the great leader and the dear leader on a wall. It's the only thing allowed on that wall, and the glass is angled so that it doesn't you know, glare, have glare in the sunlight. Uh, but this is how pervasive the totalitarian is, like we, totalitarianism in North Korea. We think it's kind of like, you know, don't do this, don't do that. Every aspect of your life in that country has been, you know, kind of dictated by the state. In fact, early in the book, I have Kim Jong-il railing against spare time because spare time leads to liberalism and hooliganism, and after that, you're, you're going to fail the revolution. And in fact, if you're speaking on behalf of the people, anything is allowed you, and, and there is nothing beyond the state, and the state is the masses, and if you transgress against the masses, you seed your humanity, and therefore anything that can happen to you is your fault. Kim Il-sung said explicitly that the enemies of the revolution should be exterminated to three generations. Um, so what they have in North Korea is something called the family purge, the Yangoje. So if something that if someone in your family does something bad, they will take three generations of your family. They will not tell you what the crime is. They will not have a trial. You will be rounded up in the middle of the night and sent to a camps. And since the whole family is going, you have no way of knowing which is the one who sent you there. Um, this is something even Stalin in his wildest dreams never dreamed of. Uh, and this is happening to this day. And they brag about it. Uh, they are proud of this because they're quote unquote purifying the blood. Uh, although North Korea is often regarded as communist because of its roots, it's far, far closer in its ideology to Nazi fascism. Um, they speak constantly of how the South has had their blood ruined 
by the fact that they're intermarrying with the U.S. imperialist apes, you know, let alone other minorities. It's just absolutely outrageous. Uh, there's a metaphor they use that not one drop of ink shall be spilled in the Han River. And yes, they will admit now that the South is wealthier than they are, but they are saying that they're the ones who are holding on to North Korean purity. And everything in North Korea has to be Korean-based and for Koreans. Their philosophy, Juche, is usually translated as self-reliance. Uh, in actuality, as I often say, it means smurf because it's a word with no meaning and every meaning and you'll have Juche architecture and Juche literature and Juche acrobatics and Juche anything and it translates to that which the great leader and the dear leader want. All literature has to be about glorifying the great leader and the dear leader and I have him make this ironic comment in this book that people condemn North Korea. If you go to a bookstore there's only books about Kim Il-sung and Kim Jong-il. That's not true. We have a book about another person. And that really is the case. There's one book about the North Korean Nelson Mandela, Rian Mo, uh, who was held prisoner in the South for 35 years. So it, everything has to be about uh, the leaders at all times. They are not taught geography. I met a couple of refugees. They did not know about Hiroshima. They did not know about Nagasaki. Uh, they were told only, you know, if any school in the States, you're going to have that world map on the wall. There, they are only taught about Russia, China, Japan, the U.S. imperialists. Uh, and South Korea, uh, maybe there's one or two others, and that's it. Because if it's not Korean, you don't need to know about it. Um, excuse me. Oh, sorry. sorry. Okay. Um, and it's it's what's really tragic is now you're having a lot of people uh, who are escaping to the South are having com being completely unable to adjust to life there. Their accents are regarded as guttural and low class. They have no skills. They've never seen a computer. Their entire lives have been regimented so that they don't know that they have to have an alarm clock and get to work on time. They're treated completely terribly and, and you know, being from a militaristic nation, they're often prone to violence and anger. And we're even seeing recently some cases of people repatriating to the North. So it, it's, it, even if tomorrow the regime vanished, um, it would still be a very, very long road to hoe for the North. And let me talk about, uh, a bit about Kim Jong-il and, and, and why he really is, is you know, truly a, a, a horrific figure. So after Kim Il-sung died in 1994, or even a little before they died, food was becoming an issue. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, those friendship prices went away. North Korea did not have uh, any electricity because they didn't have gasoline. And there was this amazing inversion in the literature of, of Leonard Reed's story, I Pencil, because North Korea ran out of pens because they ran out of the metal to make the pens, and they ran out of the metal because they didn't have the railroads, and they didn't have the railroads because they had the railroad ties for the, the wood for the railroad ties. This was actually in the literature, and this was driving Kim Jong-il crazy. Uh, so food was starting to become scarce. And Kim Jong-il launched a campaign called Let's Eat Two Meals a Day Instead of Three. Uh, because eating three meals a day is unhealthy, so it's good for you that you don't have food. And in 1994, it was not at all clear that you know he would take over. He kind of vanished from power for a little bit. Uh, and when he reappeared, his campaign slogan was, "Do not expect any change from me." Uh, the probably the, uh, one of the more bizarre political slogans of our time. <laughs> And in fact, it was very, very unusual that Kim Jong-il would be the successor. When he was declared the successor publicly in 1980, the rest of the Soviet bloc thought this was absolutely insane and obscene. It contradicts every element of communist ideology and even, uh, you know, a bit practice. Uh, and they actually address this and go into it, and I'll, I'll, I'll leave that for the book if for those of you who are interested. But all these criticisms they address about why Kim Jong-il should have taken over. So he takes over and, you know, food is becoming more and more scarce. And he's worried about, there's a Korean breed of dog. Is that breed of dog being driven to extinction? And one of the things that, the, that they did in North Korea, which is also completely much more fascist than communist, is they had something called the Understanding People Project. Now, I don't know anyone who could be opposed to understanding people, and that's the beauty of Orwellism, is everything sounds perfectly nice, and then you learn about it, and it's really not that nice. So what did they do? They interviewed every single person in North Korea, and there were several iterations of this, and you were assigned a cast rating. There's the hostile cast, the wavering cast, and the favorable cast. And then there were 51 subdivisions based on what your family was doing during the Korean War. Were you a landlord? Were you a Christian? You know, uh, you know, were you a farmer or a laborer? This determines whether you can go to college. It determines who you marry. It determines what job you have. It determines whether you can join the army. And it determines where you live. And the people with an unfavorable cast, and you're not told your cast. 
You can only kind of glean what it is by how pe people in power treat you. Those with an unfavorable caste were sent to the Northeast. They're not allowed to live near a city or near the, near the sea. Uh, they're not, certainly not allowed to step foot in Pyongyang. And when the famine hit, this was great for Kim Jong-il because he said, oh good, all the unreliable people in the Northeast, we don't have to send food there. Uh, and he said explicitly, having too many people makes socialism difficult. Uh, and rather than making the UN come in and give them food, which the rest of the world was more than happy to do, he said if the UN and these outside charities are giving them food, they're not going to need the government, so we can't have that. So you had UN people come in and they would take them to the same town literally three days in a row, pretend they're new towns, bring out the healthiest people, say we don't have a problem here. They were not allowed to have any UN inspectors who spoke Korean because uh, they wanted to have absolute control of the process. And the UN and, and, and associated agencies were eventually were like, to hell with this, this is nonsense, and they pulled out. So this is the level of, you know, people ask me, what's it going to take for, a re for the regime to fall? If you are willing to have 10% of your population starve in order to maintain your hold on power, I don't know what it's going to take to get you out of there. A huge portion of North Korea is literally subterranean. Uh, their metro in Pyongyang, which they're very proud of, all communist nations are very proud of the subway systems because it's for the people, uh, is the deepest in the world because it's a bomb shelter. These people are taught since they are birthed that as soon as the, the leaders drop their guard, the U.S. imperialists, and they can only say U.S. imperialists, they now say Americans, the U.S. imperialists are going to evade and kill them all just like they did during the Korean War. So many of the people there still remember uh, the Korean War and, and, and with, you know, with good reason they're worried about that happening um, again because war you know, is pretty awful and as libertarians we tend to realize it's really really a bad thing to happen. So it, 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 given their kind of fascist obsession with blood it was not at all unusual that the follower to Kim Jong-il uh, was Kim Jong-un. Uh, the people at the very top in the north are there simply because of their loyalty. They are not there because of their skills or anything like that. They are there because they have pleaded loyalty to the regime and to the Kim family. Uh, only the loyal people are allowed to step foot in Pyongyang and within Pyongyang itself. There's a city within a city where the party meets and, and, and runs the show and that you, none of the buildings have signs. Uh, if you want to know where a building is, you would know about it, otherwise mind your business. Um, when you go through Pyongyang, you see all these amazing monuments, you know, like it, the Soviet Union symbol, of course, was very famously the hammer and sickle. Uh, in North Korea, it's completely different because it has, it's the hammer and sickle and a writing brush. Um, because North, they add the writing brush for the intellectuals, once again, and they're completely unlike Marxism. And you go there and you see these huge monuments that are several stories high, a fist holding up a sickle and a fist holding up the, the writing brush. And you realize this was built at the expense of food. Um, people are not allowed to leave the country. Even if you're a diplomat, you have to have family staying behind so that you make sure you come back or else they're going to be punished for your transgressions. Uh, the only good thing is that recently during the famine, starting with the 90s, is the government has not been able to provide food for the people, which means the border between North Korea and China, there's a river, the Tumen River, is very porous. So those guards are not getting fed, so people go across to China, they smuggle ginseng or whatnot, they come back, the guard gets a cut. And the thing that brought down the Soviet Union and will hopefully bring down the North Korean regime was this creeping sense of cynicism. Uh, very famously, during the 80s, you know, Russian women watched Dallas and Dynasty on TV, saw how the maids were dressed, and were like, why am I putting up with dialectical materialism nonsense when I could have nice clothes? It doesn't make any sense. And, and People in the North, word of mouth travels very, very quickly. They see how poor people live in the South. They see how dogs in China have meat when they haven't even seen meat in years, is a very famous story. And they start to realize this is not all it's cracked up to be. It's very easy to convince a, ca a captive nation that they are wealthy and happy. It is almost impossible to convince a, a person that they have more food on their plate this year than they had last year, or that their children aren't really hungry, or that that hunger is a good thing. So these are the only kind of cracks that are possible in the regime. However, North Korea is an absolute surveillance state. 
Everyone in the country is assigned into a group based on your school, the union, the, lady, the communist women, something like that. Once a week, everyone in the country, everyone, has to get up and have a criticism session. They have to say, this is what I did wrong this week. I was late to work. I didn't pay attention to the phone or something like that. Then your colleagues have to get up and say, I saw Carl coming in late to work. I saw what he wouldn't be, and something like that. So you are constantly under surveillance by everyone else. And they're looking for things to say about you. So the idea of people colluding and starting some underground is absolutely impossible. Uh, you will be rewarded very handsomely for turning people in. And when you're hungry, that is a very big incentive to do this. So I don't know what's going to help the, uh, the, the North Korean people. I just felt it was very important for me to present what's going on there in a package that is both coherent, logical, and entertaining. Uh, because there's books out there that are very, very, very good, but they're dark and depressing as hell. And there's books that are, you know, uh, kind of histories, but it's, they're collegiate and it's not for the lay reader. And my background is writing popular books, and I thought it absolutely behooves us to have a book that anyone can read on the plane or something like that. And by the time they're done, they're going to understand what's going on there. The one thing I would want people to take away, even if they don't read Dear Reader, is uh, when you say that North Korea is crazy, there's two senses that that means. One is, when you say someone's crazy, that their, their actions are completely random and coherent, and they're not that. There's also crazy in the sense of, when, if someone is delusional, if I have the belief that I, um, if I am in a room with celery, it will give me cancer, it'll be very easy to address this craziness. Just don't put celery around me. Everything else will be perfectly normal. So their actions are very coherent, uh, predictable, and follow a logic which, by looking at it from the West, seems completely incomprehensible, but if you go back and figure out how it got to be this place, it makes perfect sense. And I'll give you one very good example before I, I open. It's time for questions? Yeah. Before I open the floor to questions. They have a constitution, and this is an artifice for Western eyes. They also, but that doesn't, it's not what governs North Korea. The idea that North Korea had this kind of system of law is, of course, absurd to us. They have a Ten Commandments of Kim Il-sung, and it's like, you shall have no leader above Kim Il-sung is literally the first one. The last one of which is, you know, the, the Mount Pic 2 bloodline shall be continued through the generations uh, until the revolution is done, which is what sets up the order of succession. So, you know, much of what they present for the outside world is gamesmanship. Like, they know, you know, communist nations have these constitutions. You want a constitution, we'll give you one. But we're going to do what we please and operate under our way, which is what Juche means. And they gloat in the fact that they can flout the rules of the outside world and from their perspective we're the only ones holding on to you know the statist ideal and the rest of the world is being poisoned by the toxic yellow winds of capitalism so that's what we're up against and, and I'll be glad to you know open floor to any questions I'm sure there'll be several thank you are we gonna have a, you wanna have a mic? Go ahead. Well, let's wait for the bike. Great talk. Thank you. Um, I would imagine that the military is treated very well, that they eat well, and that so do the police because they need them to keep the people in line. Is that true? Well, uh, the mil no one eats well. Um, the military is a huge percentage of population in North Korea is like the fourth largest military in the world, even though they have 24 million people. What's amazing about them is the military does all their construction. Uh, so instead of sitting around waiting for a war, they're actually putting up these buildings, but they don't have gasoline, so a lot of these buildings uh, come up roughshod and crappy. And in true egalitarian style, I, I, it's my understanding that the women have to work as hard as the men and produce equal results. Uh, because, of course, why let the facts of reality you know, violate your philosophy? So uh, they, no one's eating well in that country whatsoever. Yes? You want to pass the mic? Pass the mic? Yes. Terrible deeds, much worse even than the Nazis. Oh, yes. The history. And uh, just one thing, because you mentioned both Ayn Rand and Commander Buecher, the Puebla. Yeah. There's a wonderful essay that she wrote, The Ordeal of Commander Buecher. The ordeal that he faced, not there, but when he came back here, and they criticized him for um, making a, 
confession at a, uh, in, in a thug country right. and what she thought should, should happen in the future. So that I directed to that. Yeah, oh, I, I own everything I ever wrote. The, 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 actually, the one essay that of hers that I could not get out of my head the whole time was The Monument Builders. Because uh, you're seeing all these monuments, and she always talks about the more rinky-dink and pathetic a dictator, the bigger the you know, accomplishments they claim and the bigger the monuments. And you're standing there looking at it, you're like, okay, this is what she meant, you know, in the flesh. Uh, go ahead. What do you think the actual prospects of overthrowing the regime are in the next several years? Uh, the prospects of overthrowing the regime in the next several years are nil. Uh, I don't, I can't even imagine a scenario how they would be overthrown externally. They 100% have nukes. Uh, they would have absolutely no compunction about using them. Uh, again, they're hugely subterranean. They've been, Kim Jong-il boasts that he turned the nation into a hedgehog, by which he means something that cannot be attacked from the outside. Uh, they've been planning for this for a very long time. And something I talk about in the book is, if you look at most of these nations, when the dictatorship falls down, the dictators themselves and their, and their regime are personally murdered. So there's a huge incentive for those people at the top, like, you know, to not go the Ceausescu or the Gaddafi route. And even if they don't believe it, as soon as they liberalize, they will be killed with good reason. So that's just another uh, reason for them not to fall. So the prospect... It's very, very dark and very, very frightening, but the book's hilarious as the cover. <laughs> that, that was the, what I kind of set out to do. Yes, yeah. can you pass in the mic? Two questions. Um, one is, uh, who are the people who were with you on the trip, the Americans? Uh, you said it was a group. They were not Americans, so the trip, uh, the tour, people were just tourists from all around the world. It was very cosmopolitan. The suit, uh, $140 cash, and she, and here's something interesting. So they want the U.S. currency as much as possible. Uh, currency has an inflation in sense of uh, it goes, it, if it gets ripped or old. So she wanted the new 20s, not the 20s that had wear and tear. So she, and, and she was just, the tailor was looking at my wallet, I'm like, lady, I only have these two 20s left. And she's like, oh, I don't know which one. So it, it was a kind of a poignant and, and interesting moment. And I would encourage anyone to go. It's just an absolutely fascinating thing. And, and, and hopefully I want it to be where people can't go to North Korea because it won't exist uh, in the near future. Yes, go ahead. I'm a bit of a numbers person. I don't understand the numbers. If nobody's producing anything, how could they have such a powerful army and such powerful armaments? Because so all, the, all, the, all the money's going to armaments, and the, the food is coming from outside sources, and there are these little markets that are springing up. And again, you had 10% of the population die, and pretty much everyone's still hungry there. So it, it's, it, and they, they, do, they do these weird things, like they'll retrofit, like they'll turn cars to be, uh, you can drive the cars with wood instead of gasoline, which is very inefficient. And they do other things like, uh, you know, everyone, in, everyone, everyone, everyone in North Korea during the, fall, and during the fall goes to the fields and helps with the rice harvest. And my guide was telling me about this. I'm like, oh, that's very nice, because I think about it in this American, you know, nice, everyone's teaming up. And she's like, yeah. And I realized, you know, she's this, you know, bougie uh, city dweller, and she's got to be in the mud with these dirt farmers. Uh, and for her, it's just like, are you kidding me? You know, don't you know who I am? So it, it, they very much, you know, look down on the rural people there, which is something else I found very interesting. The propaganda didn't get to her. Yes. Yeah. Look, can uh, you wait for the mic? Could you pass this? Probably loud enough without it. <laughs> um, so... Let's say I wanted to travel there with my wife, uh, stay say three star hotels. About how much <laughs> does that run? Oh, uh, how much it costs? Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, you're not having your choice of hotels, you understand. I mean, there's, there's two <laughs> hotels, and you have to go through an established Western tour group, um, and everything's included, of course. I would encourage anyone to come to bring a lot of, like, $5 bills and just hand them out to people, because that's going to be giving them food. Uh, you just slip them in their palm. They know what to do. Um, so th th that's what I would encourage. And I would encourage anyone to go. And, and you, About what does it cost? I, I mean, go online and, and, and look. I, don't, I mean, I'm not in orbits. <laughs> We got a question in the back. Could you, could you pass it, Mike? Pass You're next. Um, I was wondering, as with the uh, new refugee movements, what do you think the prospects are for people in, that are stuck in the basically slave camps, and how do you think they're going to be able to? So okay, the, the people in the concentration camps. The people in the concentration camps are told explicitly if the U.S. imperialists invade, we are going to kill all of you and burn these camps down. 
Uh, they are, it's much more horrific. I, I don't like comparing tragedies, so let's just leave it at that. My point is, they do things like they will send men into mines and the men will literally never leave the mines and their skin will fall off because of vitamin D deficiency. Uh, they gloat that women are much better snitches than men, so they encourage the women to get extra food by, by sleeping with men and turning the men in. There's things like, you know, women being raped by the guards, which is you're forbidden to have sex with the guards. And since you had sex with the guard, they will cut your legs off, running you over, but you still have have to report to work so she's pushing herself along in a tire. Um, this is what we're dealing with. So these people have, but the insane thing is, there's a book called Aquarians of Pyongyang which is very famous. People are not given life sentences. Sometimes they're given a finite sentence you're not told and after 10 years you're released into North Korea and you have to sign a paper saying I will never tell anyone what happens here. The, I spoke to refugees. The refugees absolutely know that people get vanished. So they are aware that this kind of, and, and the one thrill, I'm, you know, I'm kind of a little bit of a twisted person, the one smile I got in my face was in the book Aquarians of Pyongyang, the family that got sent to the camps, the, the aunt, um, uh, they, they had emigrated from Japan to Korea, uh, or the grandmother, excuse me, she was a hardcore communist, you know, this is going to be great, and she, they get sent to the camp, and she couldn't reconcile, she goes, this shouldn't be happening under communism, and it's like, brother, you asked for it, you know, th this is what that means when you have no semblance of human rights, and your only justification for living is being a function of the state. Uh, guy behind you. Yes. I am Korean, <laughs> contrary to my appearance, though. No. <laughs> uh, if I ask my question, let me clarify something. You said that you say that uh, uh, Hotel Alcatraz? Yes. The Alcatraz? Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay, so that's what you said. Yeah. 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 Ye
several experiences, and I know this firsthand because he's a friend of ours. So one of the things that happened was he got out to some of these institutions where they had tuberculosis patients. And they gave them seeds, they talked about raising their consciousness about green foods, because that's one of the things that you can use. But in addition, they worked inside with the doctor. And here's the equipment that the doctors were using. They were using x-ray equipment that actually caused the x-rays to go on to the doctor. Oh, yeah. And, I mean, this, this is a bona fide story. And I think it's pacification to the West to say, oh, look at all these aids that are coming our way, and we, you know, the, reluctantly accept it. That's my perception. Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Go ahead. Um, uh, 300, 300, 300 unfortunate young women were kidnapped in Nigeria a few days ago, and you would think this is the great new cause. It's a terrible event, but 24 million have been That's in right. prison for decades. That's right. Not that I want Hollywood to take up a cause that, that's significant of nothing, but it would seem to be helpful if we could make the cause that you've exposed popular and, and relevant and covered in the media. Is there some, some trick to make the story more, more publicized? I'm doing what I can. You know, I mean, that's my whole point with this book. I've gotten an enormous amount of press. I was on Carson Daly. Uh, I had a piece in The Guardian today. I'm going to be in The Atlantic Wire next week. Uh, I, I can only hope that people buy the book and recommend it, and especially people in the liberty movement, they very much are interested in this. This is the lowest hanging fruit, and it's something that, you know, I mean, the, I, how do you affect change in another country? And also you might say that the purest competition between communism and capitalism in the world is, cap is South Korea versus North Korea. Yes. I mean, that debate was settled three decades ago. There's a very famous picture of this Korean peninsula at night, and North Korea is just black void, and South Korea is this bright yeah, sunlight thing, so yeah. it's. Um, it, Last question, okay. and then we'll, we'll go to book signing. Okay, he's got the mic, I'm sorry. Oh, we got a Patriot. There's absolutely no way I would go back to North Korea. And, he, and here's why. You're only given your visa the day of. I couldn't believe I was, I was going to be allowed in until I actually stepped foot in there. So I, I don't want to spend thousands of dollars to go to Beijing, and then I'm in Beijing, and they're like, sorry about it. So I, I, I'm not even going to roll those dice. They, they're aware of this because I was in North Korea news, and they're 100% aware of this book. Um, so, so that's that. So now we're going to go. Now we're going to, Michael, we'll move to the, to the back room back there. Let me just say, if you want more, just go to kimjongilbook.com. It's on Amazon. It's on Kindle. And I'll be glad to sign whatever you want right now. Thank you.